What's going on everyone and welcome to Method in the Madness. This is the podcast that not only delves deep into design and creativity, but leadership, productivity and all things personal development. And we are at episode 10 already. Wow. And uh, in episode 10, I get to sit down with a good friend of mine who is called David Eustace. And David is an incredibly talented photographer and director, primarily known for his work in the kind of fashion and portrait world. And David and I were introduced through a mutual friend, Don Smith, who is the guest on episode one of the show. And ever since I met David and heard his story and learned about his career, I've just had like a list of questions I've been dying to ask and I'm kind of getting them on a one-to-one. So the podcast was the absolute perfect opportunity for that. And David gives us a great insight into kind of his life story and career, you know, from being born in the east end of Glasgow in the 1960s to becoming a minesweeper to working in a prison to becoming a household name in the fashion and editorial world as a photographer which is pretty incredible. David also tells us some funny stories about working with the brand Anthropology and some of the kind of projects he got to do with him as well as his experience shooting I mean huge names like Paul McCartney, Sting, Jamie Oliver, Sophia Loren, you name it. And uh, we also talk about how digital photography has completely changed the landscape of photography as well, you know, for the good and for the bad. You know, how has it allowed great photographers to become even better at the craft, but how it's also allowed bad photographers to almost become a norm. And we also talk about, you know, is is there an ability to have that kind of powerful portrait, that one powerful image that becomes like, you know, world famous and things like that as well. And David just has a fantastically positive outlook on life and he's one of the nicest guys I've ever met and he's been incredibly supportive of me since the day I've met him, which I can't thank him enough for. And like I said, I've always just wanted to sit down with him one-on-one and kind of bombard him with a list of questions. So without much further ado, please welcome David Eustace to Method in the Madness. David, thank you very much for coming on the show. Um, we've been looking forward to kind of getting you on the podcast. You're one of the names that I had on my hit list when I started this, so I really appreciate you coming on. Don't be off. Thank you, mate. <laughs> it's my pleasure. Um, despite the volume of work and yeah. success as a photographer that you've had, you actually found photography quite late on, like into your 20s. Mm-hmm. Uh, is that right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. And then you went on to study photography in your late 20s. What was like, your life like leading up to that moment well it's it was it was brilliant it was different and it was brilliant but it's all on you and i think that's relative uh you, you you never miss what you don't know or what you don't understand and i had a brilliant upbringing i had everything that was important i was surrounded by family friends security love uh, i always joke i see i never knew any poor people everybody was in the same boat uh so, you know, so it was like I couldn't miss what I didn't understand or I couldn't comprehend. And that, that was the reality of a lot of it. I just could never have come. If you were to ask me now, you know, looking back. <laughs> at what, but I think there's a balance in everything that you do. I think there's certain things that remain true throughout. And that's basic principles, common decency. Uh, and I think that's the foundations of, you know, who you are then. It's irrelevant what you're doing or where you are or or, or how much you're worth. You know, I yeah. think it's it comes down to common decency. But you didn't have a necessarily typical upbringing. No, I, I mean, but it was typical for where I grew up to a certain extent. You know, I mean, I was adopted uh, for a start, and I found that out when I was fourteen. Uh, but I oh, had right. friends who were like brothers to me, and we all grew up in this one little uh, scheme or, or area in Glasgow. Uh, and it was a wonderful little place, you know. It was in the East End, uh, but it was all I knew, so it was it was it was wonderful. Uh, when I look back, as I say, then you think, "Oh, that was about this," but I wouldn't change anything. And I think that's the two major things, you know. Yeah, it makes you who you are. Yeah, I think when you when you do experience more, you can look back and go, "There was nothing I would change about my upbringing," and and it's 
I think you're very fortunate and blessed if you can say that, and I can say that. So. Yeah. So how did you discover photography then? Uh, well, I was older. I was 27, 28 when it started as a hobby, and, and I was a prison officer. I was working in, in Glasgow and, and Berlin, and which was brilliant. I mean, that was another thing. It's like everything else. People have these preconceived ideas of what life was like, and, you know, what was Barlini like back it was then? I, I enjoyed that. I got on well with most people that I worked with. Uh, and also the people that, you know, <laughs> let's say were customers. A lot, of the, a lot of the boys I worked with, I could have been one of those boys, you know. And, and the jails are, by and large, a place that nobody really wants to work in or visit. Uh, I ended up there because it was a job. That, that's the truth of the matter. I grew up next to the jail. I grew up with boys. Some of them ended up been in prison and some of them ended up working in it. But again, it comes back to that principles thing. I said, you know, if you work in a prison, then my whole approach to it was I have to be the best I can be. And what I mean by that is someone who is fair, someone who doesn't try to judge people, because it wasn't a role to judge people when I worked in prison. Uh, and you try to understand each individual case and situations like that, but I think power, and, and I use that word loosely, but within a, when you've got a key to a cell door, you have power. I think you it brings responsibility. So I think you have to sort of grow up a bit, yeah. and you've got to think of other people. And, 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 and that, that didn't do me any harm. I loved it. I always say working in a jail was 70% boredom. It was 20% <laughs> hysterics and 10% you were shitting yourself, you know? <laughs> so it's that balance, and, and that that's what it was. It wasn't... Again, I can only view that world now looking back on it. Yeah, in hindsight. But at the time, I was grateful for a job. I met some brilliant people. I still keep in contact with some on both sides of the fence. Uh, and, and, and it to certainly formed me to who I was, and it came in handy for you know, dealing with people later on in different environments. Mm. So it was good. No, I enjoyed it. And you were doing I wouldn't go back and do it now. <laughs> I wouldn't last five minutes in a jail now. But, you know, I think it's that whole mentality that I am so glad I was part of it. And I met some really good people in a jail, you know. Yeah. So were you doing photography as no, a hobby? No, no, no. Uh, well, yes, towards the end. Uh, it was a hobby. I'd been working in the jail for uh, five, six years. And it was a hobby and it was becoming more, it was becoming a passion. And and it was something I, you know, I never really knew you could make a living from it back then. And I remember there was a riots in 1987 in Berlin. There was a, a whole chain of riots were going on through the, the, the prison service at the time. And I just thought, you know what, I don't see me doing this for the next 30 years of my life. And it was a balance. It's, and when I look back, it's never just been one thing. And it was a balance. It was a balance where... I want to do this for the next 30 years and also by the way this new hobby that I really have became all consumed by uh, popped up and I thought maybe I want to do that and I always I always fancied going back to education but I never had any qualifications so it was a hobby and for about a year and a half I taught myself more than the basics because I was full on I was in there as soon as I finished work, straight in there, you know, I, I was spending every hour I had in there and making plenty of mistakes and trying again and pushing myself. And I was fortunate that I was accepted as a mature student on the strength of this portfolio I had made as a hobby. So I was given that offer, maybe about a year and a half after the riots, uh, do you want to go back to full-time education and work in this passion you've always done? Or, or what do you want to do? And we just decided I would go back and, and do it, so... Where was that, sorry? In uh, Napier, Edinburgh, Napier. Okay. Uh, which was in Edinburgh. We were living in Partick in Glasgow. And I remember going to the college in Glasgow and they suggested, they looked at my portfolio and they were very commercially focused. And Glasgow School of Art at the, the, the time was far more arts-based, where Napier had a brilliant balance. And, and it was learn your trade in the first couple of years learn how to take photographs and then in your your your, your final year or your, or your last two years think about why you're taking photographs so it was a perfect balance and it was actually the college in Glasgow that I went to see and they suggested 
I go and do the degree course at Napier. Well, so I drove through. And these were the days you went to university five days a week, no five minutes a week, <laughs> you know. And for three years, I drove every day through to, to from Partick to Edinburgh. And I loved it. I loved it. Wow. Um, so leaving uni, mm-hmm. you've got your degree. Um, how did you set out into the, the big bad world of becoming a well, photographer? Well, I was fortunate because we'd made a lot of sacrifice and I put a lot of effort into it. And so obviously my wife's support. Uh, and I was older. You know, I, I was going as a 29-year-old who'd worked in a prison for the last six, seven years. Uh, and with the greatest respect, I wasn't there to fanny about. I was there to go on with it. Yeah. So I was the first person there. Yeah, I, well, I think you make the effort, you know, if you're coming to Glasgow. But again, that, that can sound worse than it is. Going from Glasgow to Edinburgh every day, you get up in the morning, you get two choices. You're going to have a good day or you're going to have a shit day. What do you want it to be? So I got up and I think, right, I'm going to go to Edinburgh. So I'm going to go and buy two rolls and sausage and listen to some dodgy music and make it a wee journey every morning. And it was brilliant. Or I'm going to get up and think, it's pushing down outside, I'm driving to Edinburgh, I'm miserable and the day's not begun yet. Which are choices? And I was coming from an environment where, and it's still to this day, uh, you know, it's something I think of that most people will never understand. What people within the police force, the prison service, doctors, nurses have to deal with. And it's the constant anything can happen, the unexpected can happen in a minute. Mm. And I wasn't really doing that. I was going from, you know, an environment where you could open a door and there could be a guy sitting and they have a really nice conversation. You open the next door and that guy's hanging. Or you open the next door and he's running at you with a blade. Or you open the next door and he's having a conversation again. Or you open the next door and that guy's just found out his wife's left him. You know, you were dealing with problems constantly, but you were you you had to react fast. And there's boys still do that, and and women obviously within the prison service now. When I was there, when I worked in the halls, it was it was just uh, guys. So I was going from an environment like that, and we had made a huge sacrifice. So I had a sort of, well, not sort of, I had a huge responsibility that my wife was carrying us for the next three years. So I had to make the best I could. And I remember going through to, to university uh, as a 29-year-old, and I would be the first one there. But I would be the first one there because, I, and to this day, I still value the opportunity that education gives us. It's such a privilege. Yeah. Uh, I think it's, it's something that we shouldn't have to consider. I think it should be there and fear for all, but it's still a privilege. You know, when you see, when I when I do my, my Dumbledore thing twice a year, getting out of degrees, I look at the front <laughs> row, and I see the people there, you know, it's, a, it's for, for so many people in this world, education can only ever be a dream. So, if the biggest grief I've got is driving through to Edinburgh, it's no exactly yeah. sacrifice. So I'd be there first, and I would often be the last to leave. Uh, so I never really saw it as a student life. I saw it as doing a shift, doing a job, uh, and I loved it. I loved it. I loved that whole, it's not always, or for me anyway, it wasn't what you, and I had brilliant uh, people who lectured. I mean, a lot of them, I had lived more of a life than they had lived, yeah, if you know yeah. what I mean, my experiences in life. Uh, but I learned so much because they came from another world, and I think, again, that's a jail trait, that you learn never to judge people. You know, and I've always been that way. I, I don't care if you don't have a pot to piss in or if you're worth a hundred squillion million quid. I really don't care. If you're a decent human being, a nice person, and you 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 get decent principles, then you're good. You know, that's how simple it is for me, you know. Mm. So what was your kind of... the fucking question. <laughs> <laughs> that's fine. So uh, I suppose when did you... Start gaining traction mm. upon leaving uni. Right. Okay. Got you. I remember it now. And get yourself so like when paid I was leaving, work, I so was at speak. that mature stage. So when it's coming to my final year, I'd already thought I knew who I wanted to work for. You know, it wasn't a case of I'm going to leave on Wednesday and then Thursday. I need to start thinking of my future. I was constantly pushing myself to practice and learn more and practice and learn more about photography. And I was looking at the and back then, you you didn't have the same choice as you've got today. And creating portfolios back then was a lot more difficult and a lot more expensive. 
And there's a, there's a kind of pressure on, you know, and I wouldn't say it was necessarily, it wasn't easier. Like, I, I feel sorry for a lot of young photographers today because, you know, it's never been easier to make a portfolio, but it's never been more difficult to get it noticed. So when I was creating my portfolio, the people you were going to see, they knew it cost you a lot of money and it would take a lot of effort. Yeah. So they would view it, whereas today it's throwaway. And one of the greatest luxury, well, the greatest luxury I believe we all have is time. And I had that time. So to work and use time to the best I could, there was no point in me leaving on a Wednesday and going to try and try and get you know work on a Thursday. Sure. I was thinking the year before, so I would make the odd trip up and down to London. Sorry, I just sat the microphone. Yeah, there. Uh, I would make a trip up and down to London, and then it was we we were broke. You know, I hear people saying oh, I'm broke now, but I still go fucking two holidays a year. You know, yeah. come on. Okay. Uh, you know, it was things like that. Like it that. was. It's it's. I, I, I don't have time for wingers, to be honest with you. But we all have a moan, and that's called being human. But you know, there's there's a balance to be struck, and yeah. for me. A lot if that more, meant a lot well, more of them around these well, days. You know, as well, you know, it's like if, if it meant getting on a bus and going down to King's Cross, and King's Cross in London was a very different place in the, the late eighties, early nineties. And and if you had to sleep out that night in the bus station because you wanted to see something the next day, then you would do it. So again, it was that approach. What are you going to do? Are you going to moan about it? Or are you going to think this is an adventure? It's going to be one or two nights in my life, hopefully. Thankfully, it's not something that's forced upon me like some poor souls who yeah. have no choice so i had that choice and and i loved it i seen it as an adventure so i had a portfolio ready by the time i was leaving i knew the people i wanted to work for i had yeah, and i yeah. think there were two qualities i has i had innocence and i had ignorance on my side that i didn't know what you were meant to do so i never balanced that out i just thought this is what i'd like to do and do it respectfully and that was innocence as well. You know, what do you mean? You can't go and knock on the door at British Vogue and say, hey, I'd like to work for you guys. That was not the path that many followed. But so what? So you knew the kind of path in terms of like what kind of photography you well, wanted to the, do? The, what I wanted to do was the kind of photography I wanted to do. Now that sounds incredibly selfish, but that's what it was all about. It was all about doing something that was more than a service industry or just a, it was a passion for me, you know? And I could only do it my way. So the, 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 the most obvious outlet for that was editorial. And back then, you had nowhere near the same amount of magazines. And then there's a thing I was joking with somebody, not joking, we were laughing about it, but it was, we were joking about, today we use the word celebrity. That never really existed then. You had famous people <laughs> and you had us. Yeah. You know, there was none of this. And, and that's why I really don't like the word celebrity, because I think it gives far too much credibility often to people who have no talent. And I think it can, to a certain extent, dilute the value of really talented people. Yeah. You know, so it's, it's, a, it's a, a balance. Uh, but then there was no celebrity. So, But I knew the magazines I wanted to work for and I hoped to learn from. So at the time... The people whose work, and the only way you could see the work was obviously going by a magazine or in a book. There was no internet. So I would see magazines like GQ and Vogue, and, and primarily they were Condé Nast titles, but there was only, realistically, a couple of dozen magazines, and out of that couple of dozen, there was only a handful, which made it more difficult to work for, and especially at a period in time when you had to know your stuff. Confidence goes a long way these days, but then you could get caught out because there was no, there was, you know, you had to be able to do it. Well, also, I, I also am presuming that, you know, back then it would have been all film as well, yeah, primarily. Yeah, so, like, yeah. well, there was you know, no you choice. literally need, and that, to know your find, you need to know your technical shit as well. well but because yeah, but that's, I would say, 99.9% .9 of photographers I knew then knew their technical shit. And that was a given. Because Could that's what you had to do. Would you get in a car without knowing how to drive it? Of course you wouldn't. And that was like photography. You had to do it. You had to know it. It, was, it, was, it wasn't even a consideration. It was almost taken. It was degrees of how good you could do your shit. Hmm. Everybody could do it. But it was how good you could do it. Yeah. And a lot of photographers really pushed to learn the lighting. And there was less consideration. And you had different levels of photographers. You had photographers who... And, I, and I hopefully this doesn't sound patronising or condescending. You had photographers who would work at 
they were known as catalogue photographers, and they were their jobbing photographers. They would go to Miami, go to South, uh, South Africa, and they would just service industry. They would provide what was required. They would just churn it out. They were never really commissioned for their voice or their opinion. Or they, they were very professional, so don't think I'm not saying that. They were incredibly professional, but they were churning it out. And they were good at working in that. They were brilliant at that. But they rarely worked editorial. Editorial became more... I remember a great editor who's now passed away at GQ, a guy called Michael Vermullen. And Michael was the first editor I worked with. And Michael used to say to me, the front cover sells the magazines, the photographs inside sell the photographer. And you were given that freedom. So if you were going to work for a magazine, be it GQ, Vogue, or whatever, it was Robin Muir at Vogue, or Robin Derrick at Vogue, or, or Alison Pincott, or Paul Bowden at, at GQ at the time, you know, they would say, right, David, uh, we want you to go and do a portrait of Gregor Matheson, and it's going to be over three pages. That was it. So I would go, right, you know what, I'm going to get a double page, a DPS, a double page spread, and maybe two other options. So I'd give them four, four portraits. And, and it was because it was your voice. That's what they were commissioning. Sure. And through your work being seen in these magazines, advertisers would look at it and go, hey, you know what? We, we like this person's work. And they would commission you to do the big ads. And the big ads, they would want you to be part of it from the onset. And and that sort of just turned into a dog's dinner. The whole thing sort of mashed together yeah. in the last few years, you know? So. so what was the kind of first piece you got commissioned for then? Well, uh, the, I remember the first piece at GQ. It was a small portrait, uh, and it was it was literally a month after graduating, and it was on a theatre group in London. There was two of that one week, and I was on the verge of coming back, and I got a phone call. I'd been in to see GQ, and the, the lady in charge at the time who commissioned me said, can you do a portrait tomorrow? And I was at King's Cross and that was the night I crashed there. <laughs> uh, I thought, yep, no problem, I can do that. And that was my attitude, yep, no problem. Uh, and it was, a, it, was, it was three people in it, they were called Serpent's Tail. I couldn't tell you any more about them. Uh, but <laughs> they were in London and I remember going to do that. And then two days later, I went and made a portrait of a Japanese theatre director called Ninagawa uh, at the Barbican, I think it was. And all of a sudden, it just took off from there. And by the end of that year, I'd, I'd shot three and possibly four GQ covers. So it's wow. only four a year. And that, that I don't mean that as a smart ass, but what I mean no, is but... that's how it worked. And then, then, you know, you get people at GQ. It was a small community. It wasn't about marketing yourself, and it wasn't about... Promotion existed to a certain extent. But a lot of it would be there was good people and good people would phone good people and sure. say, you know what, you've got to see this person's work or this person's, you know, interest. And it wasn't them. Today, I was talking to somebody on the road down here. It seems to be more about, hey, they're fun to work with. It wasn't really about fun to work with. It was about who's going to do interesting things. Yeah. And and that's what I think. was. It. And also, getting back to the film thing, you know, film was normal and you, you knew how to do it. And... A student said to me the other week, they said, David, what's the difference that you, and this is a generalization, but the difference between film and analog, uh, film and digital. Uh, and when I thought about it, there's a kind of, there's a balance. And for me, digital makes it easier for those who know what they're doing. And it makes it possible for those who don't. Yeah. And that's where I think we've got that sort of middle ground. Now, well, because like nowadays, people can take a terrible photo but make it look amazing in Photoshop. Like, they could know Photoshop better, be yeah, better at Photoshop yeah. than they are at taking well, photos and well, then make it as a photographer, yeah. which is insane. Well, it, it was a bit like, and please don't jump across the table and kill me here, right? But it was like, <laughs> a bit like working with designers and people in ad agencies is what digital is to photography in, in a roundabout way that the photography was the ammunition they needed to play with. Yeah, or they sure. need something, you know, that we can go, now we can do this, rather than going, just leave it as it is. You know what I mean? Because it was almost like a lot of it was in good designers. I've had good designers chop a couple of my images up and I would have normally been furious until I saw it and I thought, brilliant, absolutely brilliant. So I think it's about that balance and it's all about collaboration. It's working with people. 
but it's not just doing it for the sake of doing it. Mm. And I think, and that's where I think digital is brilliant because it's it's gave people who may not have an interest in photography the chance to create images that they can use as a secondary sort of love affair. Yeah. And I think that's brilliant. I, I, I hopefully won't be snobbish about photography. Uh, but there's different levels of photography, yeah. you know. Yeah, so do you, well, do you consider to have had a, a big break or a, a moment or a certain uh, commission hey. that, that kind of got you to a different level of popularity? And how did well, that I think come about? The, the, I think your first obvious one, for me anyway, was... Uh, the first GQ story. I suppose it's your first one because it gives you. And, and I, I, I had a lecturer at, at, at Napier when I studied there. It's little things. It's not a break. It's little moments that you think it has a value. And I remember a lecturer at Napier who lived a very different life than I did. He grew up in Edinburgh, blah blah. And he turned around and he said to me one day, David, what can I teach you about life? And just in that very comment. It gave a value to my experiences that I thought were just, well, that's what it was. You know, a guy worked in the back end of a minesweeper and then became a prison officer that grew up in East End of Glasgow. And all of a sudden, all that experience was of value. So that's one thing I think was made me think a great deal. And that was probably the greatest lesson I learned at, at uni. Uh, I've often said it was a lecturer who taught me more than even he knew. Mm. And, and that, that was something I found interesting. But the GQ break was... Uh, I suppose something that made me thought yesterday or yesterday I was getting on a bus back home to Glasgow because we had no money and I mean we had no money yeah. uh, to go on you know last night I crashed in the station and today I'm working for GQ but you know that, so that was thing but I was asked that question before by a very famous film producer who I only knew worked in films at the time, and without name dropping, it was at, at Tracy Emmons house in the south of France, and it was a party Tracy was having, and I bumped into this guy, it was over three days, and I, I bumped into this guy, and we started talking about the visual industry and yeah. imagery, and he was a lovely guy, a brilliant guy, and all I knew his name was Jeremy, and Jeremy had, I knew he knew Ewan McGregor, so I knew he'd worked in, in the film industry, and Tracy's birthday party lasted over, as I say. It, was like, it wasn't a party for three days, but it was people popping in and out for three days. And, and I spent more time talking to this guy, Jeremy, than anybody. And it came to the night of the dinner, and I was sitting opposite Jeremy. And as the night went on, the night went on, the wine flowed, more wine flowed, and by about three, four o'clock, both of us were really quite drunk. I was very drunk. <laughs> and, and I remember saying, and Jeremy, I've had a great time. I've had a brilliant time, blah, blah, blah. And I said, what are you doing tomorrow? And he was going to Switzerland. I said, I don't even fucking know what you do. And he said, well, he said, come on, there must have been something in your career when you knew you made it. And I started laughing, you know, and that drunk, and we were, were, were pals, you know. And I, and, and I said, well, no, I, I still don't even think I've made it because I don't actually know what that means. But I said, there was one thing that did make me chuckle. And it was, we didn't have emails then, and it was a fax, and it was a big shoot I was doing for British Vogue. And I got this fax through at the time saying, did I have a preferred catering company for lunch? <laughs> and I was just thinking, I'm going to do a series of portraits, and it was lovely. And we were laughing, we were guffawing away, and I said to Jeremy, and I remember I knew very little about Jeremy. Not, not I didn't knew very little, that's not true, because I like to know as much as I can, but I don't necessarily need to know what it is you do. I just want to know what yeah, your interests course, are, what yeah. you enjoy. And I said to Jeremy, so we're laughing away. I said, come on, what about your turn now? And it went quiet and he thought about it and he turned around and he said, well, everybody expects me to say when I won an Oscar for making The Last Emperor with Bertolucci. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember just thinking, A, I'm now sober and B, what shit have I been talking for the last three days? <laughs> and so we things like that. So even for Jeremy, or people of that level, his name was Jeremy Thomas. Uh, even at that, I don't know. I don't know what making it means. Mm. Making it doesn't mean raising a child who's a good person. Is it trying to be a good person yourself? Is it helping somebody lying in a gut on the street? Is it, you know, it's a million different things. Yeah, so course. I don't know how I put a measure on success other than to say perhaps it's contentment. Perhaps it's being able to look in the mirror and think, Do you know what, I tried. 
yeah. and and that's it. So I don't I don't generally don't measure Put it, it down to like one thing or anything. No, like I don't that. measure it in fame. Fucking certainly don't measure it in fame, and I don't measure it in money. Wealth's a very different thing for me, yeah. you know. So some of the wealthiest people I know, are some of the poorest people I know, some yeah. of the poorest people I know, are some of the wealthiest people I know. It's a balance, you know. Yeah, completely. Uh, you recently spoke at an event that we had here at Signal. <coughs> excuse me, where you spoke about your work with anthropology. Uh-huh. How did that, I know obviously about the work, uh-huh. but how did the partnership uh-huh. with anthropology actually well, come to fruition? Well, again, this is another beauty of the digital age. I was living in New York. I, I'd been there for, oh, I can't remember. I, I, long story short, I had rented an apartment in New York for three months, and I ended up living there for 15 years and I loved it <laughs> but so so many years in it I was working regularly for this company called Anthropology and even that's a story in itself that I remember my agent at the time said Anthropology uh, want to book you for three days to do some fashion so I turned up to the studio and there's a huge entourage of people uh, and I start talking to the creative director and the first word that came out of my mouth was obviously in a very strong Glasgow accent. Mm. And I mumble, I'm stone deaf, so I know I mumble, I laugh at it, you know. Yeah. I, mean, I don't take it too serious. When you're deaf, you think every fucking buddy speaks the way you do. <laughs> uh, and and it, and he comes back to me in a very strong Scottish accent, but more, and I'm like, this is really fortunate. Somebody understands what I'm saying. So we, 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 we got on really well. We joked about it because he wasn't aware I was Scottish. And he was saying to me, you know, I just saw this body of work you've made called The Buskers. Uh, and I started laughing and I said, you know what, I made this years ago, but it had been sitting in a box in prints. But because of the digital age, I had just digitised it and put it online. So this oh, is maybe wow. 20 years later. And he said, well, that's the essence of what we love for anthropology. And we had this fancy setup, And I remember going to shoot and, and I was all over the place. I said, what, you, what, why did you book me because of the buskers? He said, yeah. And I said, well, why don't we shoot this like the buskers? And we stripped everything back and we shot uh, that shoot like the buskers. The same principles, very straightforward. And a relationship developed, and I would work with anthropology maybe three, four days a month for, I don't know, three or four years. Wow. It's like everything in business, a relationship would develop. And after three or four years, this chap said to me, you know, we're about to launch this arts-based initiative that anthropology, it's called the Anthropologist, Those Who Inspire Us. And basically, to cut a long story short, they they were a great inspiration for, I don't know what the, 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 the target age was, young female, 16 to 35, I would yeah. imagine. Uh, and they said, but we want to let people know where we get our inspiration from. So we do a project and you'll launch it, you'll be the first to launch it. And I said, right, I'm not quite sure what I'm going to do. And he said, do whatever you want. And I said, how are you going to explain that to the market? And we, we were good friends at this point. I said, you how are you? Brief like this. Yeah, Stay exactly. Christ. So, and there's a kind of irony to it. Well, you know the story because you've seen the, yeah, the, the yeah. talk I do on it. But uh, no, by, by all means, tell it. Doesn't right. it? Well, what happened was I thought to myself, right, I want to go on a road trip. My daughter at the time was 16, 17, and she'd often heard me talking about Chateau Marmont in LA, and I love Chateau Marmont. Uh, this was three years before Sophie Coppola made a movie called Nowhere. So this is a, a few, three years before it. And I thought, well, I want to go on a road trip with my daughter, Rachel. And the, the creative director was called Trevor Lund. Trevor said, great, go for it. And I said, how are you going to get past marketing? He said, don't worry about that. I will deal with that. Okay. So he said, this is the money I've got. Can you do it? And he wrote my cheque up front. I said, sure. And I thought, now I need to go and come up with an idea (laughs) that's going to actually, you know, it's got to be something I want to do. That's got to be the essence of it. It's got to be the the main focus of what it's got to be. But equally, I've got to be respectful. If a company is going to support a project I'm doing, and that's what they were doing, I would like it to benefit them. Yeah, of course. So, I Despite thought, what, like, you know, well, the, it, it the fact that like the thought of getting a brief and just kind of getting you know things like payment up front and things like that, but that, that unheard that, of that, now. But it was funny because that came it came on the back of a project I had made earlier the year before, 
called Highway 50 for USA right. Network and, and the Character Project. And I had I decided to come up with this idea, and I, I was only, without blowing smoke up my own arse, I was, there was 11 photographers asked to capture the character of America. And this was for USA Network, a huge project. Uh, and I was only known American asked to do it, uh, which was a huge honour. But I'd come up with this concept and this idea. But the anthropology one, I wanted to go on a road trip, and I wanted to go on a road trip with my daughter. And I thought, you know, anthropology primarily were selling frocks at 65 bucks, plus obviously another 100 things. But that was, they had a target audience, and they thought, and they knew who they would sell to. And I wasn't interested in selling any of that. I was interested in doing a personal project. So I remember Trevor going in for the first meeting with the marketing team and saying, right, David's going to do it. And they went, great, because they knew me because I was doing fashion for them. And they said to Trevor, right, so where's he going? And Trevor said, well, I don't really know yet. Okay, uh, but I do know he's going on a road trip. Great, what model is he taking? Well, he's not taking a model, he's going with his daughter. And they were going, well, is his daughter a model? And Trevor's going, no, he's a very attractive young lady, but she doesn't model as such. So they're going, but so we're paying for a family holiday here. <laughs> <laughs> and Trevor's going, well, yeah, yeah, basically we are, but, you know, that's what we put our faith in, and that's the whole concept of it. It's not about us giving instruction. And so we came back, him and I thought, right, okay, and I come up with this concept to go on a road trip. I wanted Rachel to we'll start by having lunch and chat on a month in LA, but I wanted her to see things like Death Valley, Monument Valley, the Grand Canyon. So I came up with this 3,500-mile trip but there's going to be one day that you end it and think, well, that's just finished. And we're going to go back to New York. Where are we going to stop? So where do you go? This is the final day. This is us. We've arrived here. And and I found a small town 200 miles south of Dallas because the whole essence of the project was a father and daughter road trip. Yeah. You know, getting to know each other, even though we're father and daughter. But it's more, Rachel, as she said, not me, I can't take any credit for this. Rachel said it was as much about you know, a daughter about to enter the next stage in her life and a father about to let go of the most precious thing in his life. Yeah. And so I said to Trevor, we're going to go on this road trip, and I found this small town called Eustace, wow. 200 miles south of Dallas. And I thought, that's where we'll end it. So we'd done this crazy route, uh, and we took a third person who was just the most incredible person was my assistant at the time was a guy called Eduardo Fiel who went on to work for Peter Lindbergh really one of the most most precious people I've ever met in my life a really decent human being who I owe so much to and Eduardo was great because he when Rachel wanted to kill me as fathers and daughters often do <laughs> Eduardo was the United Nations he was just the best hard as nails tough as nails with a huge heart and a good soul. There's very few people I admire more in this world than Eduardo. Anyway, uh, the three of us, we were going to go on this road trip. So I went back to Trevor and I said, I found this place, this is a road trip, brilliant. So he went back and he spoke to the marketing and the sales team. They, we know where David's going. Great, 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 great. Okay, what are we getting from him? Well, I don't know yet. So they, they weren't sure what the deliverables would be, quote, unquote. And a week before we were going, uh, Trevor got a, an email or a phone call and him and I met for a coffee in Brooklyn and they're based down in Philadelphia. So he came up and he said to me, right, it's all good to go. We're all good to go. But he says, what a meeting that was. I said, why? He said, well, you know, they can accept. We don't know where he's really going. We don't know what we're getting from him. And it's a family holiday. But David's not asked for any clothes yet. Now, keep in mind, anthropology is a clothes call. <laughs> and Trevor said, no, because he said she won't be wearing anthropology clothes. And they just washed their hands of it. And that's the truth. They, they were just like, well, we don't want anything to do with this. Now, I'm going to fast forward a bit. We went out and we created this portfolio called In Search of Eustace, a father and daughter's road trip. And it was online only. And it came out and we'd gathered little notes. We wrote little, just little thoughts. And Rachel took some photographs. I took some photographs. And we made basically a journal, a three-week document or a journal of a father and daughter's road trip. And it went ballistic online. It really took off. Oh. Because you know what was funny about it all? 
See the sixty-five dollar frock that Anthropology, and I'm I'm taking that as a throwaway line. Yeah, sure. But the sort of clothes they were selling, they never stopped selling. But we weren't selling that. We were selling things like love, family, hope, insecurity, and we were attracting an audience that was genuinely quite sincere. And they were seeing, you know, fragility within a relationship. They were seeing, you know, insecurity. They were seeing love. They were seeing hope. And Anthro started getting emails from people like. There was one chap who took his 90-year-old mother on a road trip wow. because he'd saw his, gran- his granddaughter do it. So it was secondary audience and, and, and creating a bigger thing. So as I say, we weren't selling a $65 frock. We were selling hope, family, love, and yeah. values. And, and it went ballistic. And then the following year, they asked me to get involved in it again. And I, <laughs> So Trevor said to me, right, marketing now love you you know six months ago they wanted to wash your hands and and it was all your fault until it went brilliant and it was their idea which it fucking wasn't take my words and trevor lunn was the main support in that thing he was brilliant and i went and they said to me right what you do i said well i've only got the one daughter i've only got the one you know child so i'm not going to go on another road trip he said just do something close to your heart and trevor being scottish i thought you know what trevor loved to do I'd love to go and do something out at Hebrides, just a series of landscapes about how a moment in time will only ever happen once. And it was it was considered photography. And I always remember, he says, how the hell am I going to explain this one? Then? <laughs> so he went back, we met a month later or whatever, and he said, right. He said, I went in and I told him, big meeting. David's going to do it. Yay, they're all happy. Right. Uh, is he going on a road trip with his daughter? No, he's not going with his daughter. Oh, good, so is he taking a model? No, he's not going with a model. He's just going with his assistant. Right, where are they going? Uh, the Hebrides. Right, where's the Hebrides? Scotland. Where's Scotland? <laughs> yeah, and it, it was part where's of Scotland? that. I mean, that's, that's tongue-in-cheek, but there was part of that in it. And what's he going to do? He's going to shoot a series of landscapes. But no model, no people, just landscapes. Are they like, like, like the, the, you know, is it like Bahamas? And he goes, no, he wants to shoot thunderous, angry skies, but it's just specific moments in time. And again, they were going, but we sell clothes. And, the, the, you know, it was that whole thing. And that's me generalization. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a generalization. But there's a lot of really good focused people. I think one of the things about anthropology at that time, there was something that everybody else wanted to be without trying to be. And I think because there was a guidance at that point, they were a brand, but they didn't really know what a brand was and they didn't really care what a brand was. It's a bit like in the UK with Paul Smith, or Paul Smith and Vivian Westwood. Mm. They do what they do and they let others, but we've just become so inundated and logged down and suffocated by this, what's the competition doing? What's current? What's new? What's next? Yeah, of and course. to me, that that's the 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 greatest enemy you ever want to welcome to your door. So, the, I said I'm going to do these landscapes, and I went to the Hebrides, and I made this thing called Highland Heart. And again, it, I was very fortunate that it went down really well. Uh, a lot of people saw it as Scotland, the old country, yeah. and, and there was there's an element of romance about angry it skies, by you know. Twice, didn't it? Well, Two and, and th- in a row. one of the things that was interesting, and what, uh, one of the things that was playing in my mind was, when you look at t- autumnal colours and textures and tones within that sort of rugged landscape, they weren't a million miles away from what anthropology were embracing and what they were doing. And so it appealed that romanticism and that connection really worked to an audience. Mm. And, and and I think one of the things we make a huge mistake, we don't give audiences enough credit. We think they're stupid. You know, people are not daft. People think and they want interesting things. And I was very fortunate that six months later, Pixar released a movie after we'd launched it. Pixar removed, uh, released a movie called Brave. Oh, yeah. and, and people were going, whoa, this is just like the same sort of landscape. And then they started thinking was the stuff I would do in CGI. And I'm thinking, no, that's 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 what it looks like. You just need to go out in the rain, yeah. you know? <laughs> uh, and, and then they asked me to do it the following year. And Trevor had just left, the creative director had left. Yeah. He'd went to a company called David's Bridal. And I think it was a president, a chap called Glenn, had went to David Uerman, which is a big American company, 
Uh, and I, I, I will always be incredibly grateful for Anthropology. I thought they were a brilliant company then to work for. I don't know. I don't. I've not worked for them for a few years now. But things move on, and, yeah, of and it was a great project. It was a great oh, project, awesome. and it only happened because they supported it. So yeah. I, I hope you know. Lots of happy across. accidents. Yeah, like little victories along yeah. the way. Um, you've had the privilege of shooting some, obviously mega famous people before like sir uh-huh. paul mccartney and sting and uh-huh. Uh-huh. sophia loren as well yep, like yep. as the photographer you obviously kind of have your artistic vision that you want to achieve from the shoot and yeah. what you want to get out of it how as the photographer how do you get the model in the headspace in the kind of frame of mind to deliver what you are looking for artistically uh, especially well, with kind of some big personalities well well there's a, there's just those three people you mentioned and there's something really interesting about that that paul mccartney uh, sting and sophia Loren. those three people in particular and i'm just using those three because we've mentioned them those okay. three people uh sting paul and and sophia Loren, they became the result or their success became what it was because of the passion they followed. Paul McCartney was a musician who became famous, made a lot of money. Yeah. Sting, vice versa. And Sting uh, and Sophia Lennon is an actor or actress. Actress or actor, I don't know what it is this month. <laughs> anyway, uh, their first love was a vehicle to that found them wealth, fame, notoriety or whatever, whatever it is. There's a lot of younger ones, and again, this is quite a, a generalization, not all, but there's this, that's a celebrity thing I can't be bored with, where their desire is to be famous, to be wealthy, to be to whatever it is, and they try and find a vehicle to get there. So when you're working with somebody like McCartney or somebody like Sophie Loren, they recognize within you that what you were doing and what you were producing and creating was the equivalent of what would you go and ask Paul McCartney right to write a song or would you tell Paul McCartney how to write a song? <laughs> Think about that one. Exactly. Do you know what I mean? It's like would that would I go and tell the, the guy that's fitting the boiler how to work the gas pipes? Of course I wouldn't. You know, it's, it's relevant to what it is. So when it comes to photography, but I think everything's a collaboration. Mm. You know, Paul McCartney works with uh, musicians and he'll bring the right people on board and often and one thing I think back in the day that's slightly not quite as evident today you always brought people on board that were better than you because you would learn from them or they could do the job better so you know Paul McCartney is a great drummer but if he's wanting to do a piece and he's not going to drum, he's going to bring a better drummer on or he's going to bring the right drummer on. And I think that was a thing that was different, especially with those three that you named are people at that level who had, who had where fame had become a byproduct of their passion rather than fame was the ultimate goal. Yeah, You know, fame was something that just happened because of what the, the raw talent. So getting, getting back to what you're saying, getting people into the headspace, I think... When you work with people at that level, they put such trust in you and they want to know your input because they they want people who can do... I'm going to make a sweeping statement again here, but I think I'm probably a better photographer than Paul McCartney. I'm certainly not a better songwriter (laughs) or singer. But do you know what I mean? And what I mean by better is... I was asked a couple of years ago, I was doing a... Panasonic asked me to front... Either TV and Stills campaign, they they, they, they use my name and, and my work as their, their adverts. Mm. And Panasonic asked me, they said, what makes you a better photographer than anybody else? And, and I said, I'm not. What I do is I'm very fortunate. I photograph the world the way I see it. And I'm very fortunate the world likes the way I see it. Now, that's the same with Paul McCartney when it comes to music. Paul McCartney writes songs that come to his mind from his heart. And he's lucky that the world seems to like the songs he writes. Yeah. So it's all relevant to things, whereas you get a lot of younger ones, and and, and, and this and I, I hope this this does sound old and young, and it's not that way because I think there's more talented younger people now than there's ever been. But because you have access to a wider world, 
then it can often get suffocated by the mediocre. But there's never been more talented people than there is today. Uh, but a lot of people who have a confidence that can sometimes disguise that. And a, a lot of confidence comes from insecurity, yeah. you know. Uh, once you get beyond that surface, you can see them and, and you know, you, 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 can, you can figure that out. But they want, they feel, and, it, and it's a pressure, I think, it's putting the young people, there's, a, there's a, almost a thing where they feel they've got to contribute to everything. Whereas I would work with great editors or I would work with great designers or I would work with great makeup artists or hairdressers or, mm. or art directors and they'll go, you know what, I don't actually need to do anything here. This is brilliant the way it is. And sometimes, you know, that's what that's where the, the real level of experience and vision comes from. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but surely it, like it's leaving things out sometimes is more important than just putting it in. So I think a lot of Newer crowd feel they've got to justify their position, mm. you know. So were you always kind of, I suppose, fortunate where you were put into situations where your vision and your artistic input was welcomed? Or did you have, like, I'm sure there's probably celebrities that go along to photo shoots these I, days where they're just like, I can't be arsed with this. And, you well, know, I, like... Uh, I think... I don't think it's just one straight thing. I'm not really interested in things unless I can contribute. Because why would you want me on board? Why would you want me there? And it, and it's not an ego thing. Because I, I often say I've learned more from people I've argued with than people who just agree with everything. So it's a collaboration, but you measure it. You think, you know what, that's actually a really good point. Yeah. Or you're going to meet a client for the first time. And you can walk in there with a thousand ideas, but that client might have had a thousand meetings. And that client might be, so you, it's trying to amass information. So you're trying to understand, you know, why are you there? What's the purpose of you being there? What can you bring to it? And it's always a collaboration, but you can only really have one film director and, and it's getting that measure. So it's doing the right thing for the right job. And, and I think it's often suggestions, you know, but, if you want decisions made, I'll make decisions. That's not a problem. Mm. Uh, and they'll be the decisions I believe are, are, are right for the right thing. But those decisions will be listening to other people's opinion and then forming one I think is the right one. Yeah. And it's got to be the one I think that's true to who I am and also respectful of who you're working with. Mm. You know? Do you have a, a thought process or a creative process that you go through to try and... Before before you yeah, tend to, to the do shoot. Well, yeah, and, and I've thought about that before, and yes and no is, is a really stupid answer. I think you've got to go in with an element of consideration to be respectful of it. But I think if you go in with too much consideration that you don't allow movement or lucky accidents or things to develop or passion, then you're making a mistake. Yeah. So I think it's it's been going in there respectfully with an idea, but being secure enough to go, you know what, this can develop. So that that's the yeah. short answer is yes. I think it's, you know, as if, if I'm going to photograph someone, I want to leave there knowing a little bit more than I knew when I arrived. Mm. But I only want to know what they're comfortable and I'll let me know. Yeah. 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 Uh, like, Something that I think, talking to students that I work with, they always talk about like carving out your own style or trying to be distinctive and that's how you get noticed. And there's a certain element of truth to that. Like, you know, if you blend into everyone else, then you're never going to get noticed. But I suppose how do you, you kind of came up at a time where there was, you know, lots of kind of notable photographers working in the same area as you. Did you ever feel tempted to kind of fall into the trap of, mimicking somebody else's style because that was like the hot style at the time or and how did you combat that uh, the short answer is no <laughs> and, 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 and but it's not but it's it's but it's selfish why it's not but first i would like to say that experience teaches you everything's been done mm. it's just not been done by you so the second thing is who who are you kidding are you kidding yourself or are you trying to kid other people so 
<clears throat> and I, I'm actually doing a talk in, in Tuesday to a group of students, and, and, and it's about finding your own voice. And I don't think you experience in time is the thing that allows you to find that. But you'll do work, and I produce work that was very, I would say, inspired by abstract expressionism before I even knew what fucking abstract expressionism was. <laughs> you know, because there's things that, that's like, is your favourite colour blue, yellow or red? Now, half a dozen people are going to say yellow. Half a dozen people are going to say blue. It's different, but you have a, 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 an attraction to something, sure. you know. And I think it's good for any young artist or any, any, any person to find things that appeals to them but I think it's even better for them to go, do you know what? This really appeals to me and it really inspires me. But I want to try and maybe do it first and then move on to it. It's not the end result because at the end result, you're just kidding yourself. Yeah. So As long as it's like organic and Yeah, natural. and I think, you know, you've got to do your own thing. But I, there was a student I met a couple of months ago and I, I obviously won't say it. What I can say is it wasn't Napier, so I'm glad of that. <laughs> uh, I met a student and she said she was bored. And this was a third year degree student. And I thought, really? And I said, right, I'm going to set you a test. It winds me I up. said, the test is I want you to go to the National Portrait Gallery in Edinburgh. And the only brief is you can't leave it for four hours. So don't turn up at two o'clock in the afternoon. It shuts at five, right? So you go in the morning. <laughs> and what will I do there? Whatever you want. And there's more and more. It was more about what do I need to do? What do I need to do? And I said, all you have to do is not leave the place. So I met up with them a couple of weeks later, and I said, how did you go on? And uh, no, before that, they said to me, is there photography there? And I said, I don't know. I would imagine there's some, but I don't know. And you could see that look of, but what do I need to do? And I said, that's the only criteria. You can't leave. A couple of weeks later, we met up, had a coffee. I said, how did you go on? And I said, you know what? I went there and I went to look for photography and there, there was some, but it was, wasn't that great. And I got bored, so I went and got a coffee. But you said I could do that. I said, great. Then what happened? And they said, well, I had another coffee and that killed about an hour. And I was bored having that. So, so I decided just to walk about and I, I, I vowed I wasn't going to leave. So for the next three hours, I started looking at the paintings and I started looking at what people in the paintings were wearing and I started looking at the colours within the paintings and I started noticing how sculptures were made of this and how they stood and I started looking at how things were framed and how things sat and then I started looking at the people who were looking at it and seeing was there certain people looking at certain frames was there people and I said then what happened and, and they said the next three hours flew in <laughs> and, and, and I think that's a way to do it so you to go with something where you have there's nothing wrong with being inspired there's, we're all inspired uh, is there anything wrong with being copied? No, not copying as long as you admit to yourself and to others it's a copy because you want to explore a new avenue or you want to discover something. Yeah. If you try and just plagiarise something, because, and, and, and I think this is a bit of a celebrity disease these days with the world of immediacy. The most important thing I think I said earlier on, I believe we have, is time. And even when I was taking photographs before, I would take a Polaroid. Take 90 seconds under my arm for that process to develop that Polaroid. Nowadays, everything's immediate. You take a photograph and it's straight out there. Yeah. I never. I, I, I was fortunate I had time. Even though it wasn't a great deal, I still had a few days. So it would let me revisit a photograph and it would let me reconsider it. But because of such a desire for, and I think it's a thing, I saw it in New York, and it's one of the things that put me off New York. And the UK is incredibly influenced by the West and less by the East. And I've got more of attraction to the East that the West, New York was becoming, and again, it's, it's, it, this seems to be a, a whole quote of generalizations, but that's what we do. One of the things for me in the world of photography in New York or the world of advertising or editorial photography was coming more about we fluffy dogs and cupcakes and good job. Mm. It wasn't about what we're actually doing here. And it was more about the next and the new best thing. Whereas the East was more about experience and heritage and consideration and education 
and a desire for knowledge. And, and I'm far more attracted to that. Yeah, yeah. You know? Um, just kind of going back, like talking about Sophia Loren, actually. Uh-huh. Um, You've got a thing for her, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> you have a bit of a funny story about that shoot, don't you? Well, she was lovely. There was two stories about that shoot. Uh, it was, uh, I don't know why to start with, there's two of them. And I think I mentioned earlier when I was adopted. I don't know if that's the story no, you're no. thinking about. Is that when you're yeah, thinking about the right of, yeah. before? Well, I look at well, the first heard one. the other one. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I was I was adopted, and as I said, a brilliant thing. And I now have a, just the most incredible relationship with my birth mother, who's my mother. I, I've been fortunate. I've had two mothers and two fathers. That's mm-hmm. where I look upon it. My the the family who raised me in East End, they died when I was young. Uh, well, not young, but I was 21 and 26, 27. That's young. But but, but it's <laughs> nowadays, it wasn't it then. I've been working in a prison for five years at that point, yeah. you know. Uh, I, I now meet people who seem to think they're kids at 30, you know. So it's 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 a whole balance, it's relative. So uh, I I met my birth mother, but it was actually in Sophia Loren's house. Not that I met my birth mother, that's another story. Uh, <laughs> that I have a friend who worked in the prison service and or had just had worked in the prison service with me and I had found this letter when I was 14. And I, and I said to him, you know, I'm, at this point I was 38. I'd left the prison service and he'd retired as well, but he was doing private uh, detective work. And I had this letter that I'd found at 14 telling me about my adoption. And I'd never bothered about it because I had a really incredibly secure upbringing. But I kept thinking about this young girl. All I knew was she came from the Highlands. So I said to my mate, his name was John, I said, John, go and see if this girl's still alive. If she's still alive, don't screw her life up. But if she's interested, let her know the baby, because I never knew the circumstances, has had a brilliant life. So, and John just knew I worked as a photographer. He never really knew what I'd done. He knew I was a photographer. Uh, So, he went and found, and he phoned me this night. And I was in Sophia Lorenz's house, and he phoned me and said, David, where are you? (laughs) Uh, He's never never going to believe me anyway. So, I said, I'm on a job in Geneva. And he said, right, phone me, I found your mother. So, that's where it was. And there's a kind of, there's another side, there's actually a third story. I was with a, a friend, the, the author Ian Rankin, mm. and this is what I love about, this is what I'm talking about, the thing with McCartney and these people who are at a level of professionalism. Ian and I were joking, and he said, have you written that book yet on your life? And I said, no, but I've got the opening line. I said, it's taken me five years. He said, right, hit me, what's your opening line? And this is how fast that happened. Uh, I said to him, I will be dead soon. We all will. He said, nah, nah, nah. He said, that's your final line. He said, that's not your opening line. If you just use the first half of it, I will be dead soon, then that could possibly be your opening line, but it's not a very good one because people don't want to know what it is. But he said, tell me something quite major in your life in the last 25 years. And I said, well, you know, I met my mother, my birth mother. He said, where were you? I said, believe it or not, it was in Sophia Loren's house in Geneva. He says, there's your opening line. He said, it was in it was in Sophia Loren's house I first met my mother. And I thought, it's taken me five years. <laughs> it's taken him five minutes. And he's come up with a far more interesting opening line. The second wow. story of that was a couple of months later, after the, it was for a magazine, American magazine, and it was published. And I, I, we were living in Glasgow, just outside Glasgow. And my wife's father at the local bowling club in Mary Hill he loved Sophia Loren. So I was in Glasgow City Centre. I came home one night and dearly my wife had been making, you know, the dinner. And she said, the phone just rang. And it was one of these ring, ding, ding ones. You know, it was a had a landline. She answered the phone and this voice said, can I speak to David Eustace? And dearly said, you know, it was it could have been Italian, it could have been French. It was obviously somebody from uh, the overseas. And she said, he's not available at the moment. Dearly thought it might have been somebody for one of the magazines that I worked for. And she said, well, if you just let him know, this is Miss Sophia Loren. And I saw the magazine and I think it's wonderful. <laughs> oh my and God. I just want to thank him. And dearly thought, my father's going to live on this story <laughs> for the rest of his life in Mary Hill Bowling Club in Glasgow. And so, that, but that's shows you the level of... That's brilliant though. No, but that's what good people like. I remember I had met my birth mother who's named Rita, 
and I was flying about Europe with Paul, with Paul McCartney, and, he, and it wasn't his project, he'd rent a project. And we were jumping about, and I was telling Paul about it, and he said, oh, the lovely Rita. <laughs> and then he got a nice box of chocolates. Oh, wow. And he just wrote to the lovely Rita. I now, love people like that don't need to do that, and that's what I'm saying, and that's the kind of good shit that I believe in giving back. Yeah. You know, if you can help people, and that's where the principles come into it for me. Yeah. So. Um, you know, if anyone is passionate about photography, well, take portrait photography for argument's sake. There are images that stick out, like famous images that stick out in people's mind. Like for me, like I suppose Richard Avedon's Marilyn Monroe yep. portrait, yep. or uh, I'm a massive Albert Watson fan as well. So yep. like his Hitchcock one, or his like uh -huh. Jagger kind yep. of the, cat the, face. The, the Jagger. Uh -huh. Like these. Like these are like powerful portraits that will go down in like the history books. Mm -hmm. Do you think we've kind of lost the power of that? Like well, because we're in the kind of consumption age. And, well, I you think know. I think there's something here, and I don't want to sound like a smart ass, but every one of these images you mentioned, I knew right away. Whereas a whole generation, I don't think even know the photographers. Yeah, and I think that says a great deal because it's, um, it, it's not about learning who's trendy, who's current, who's whatever. For me, it's learning the foundations. Uh, <clears throat> Do I think we've lost that? I think like the ability for somebody to like put an image out there no, and then it's, no, it's, I, I think like we're, in twenty years' time we're going to be. Talking I think about we're still it. doing that, but I think we are getting suffocated by the ordinary because before to have a platform, a globe, like, let's take it in another text. Hmm. Look at this current political system we're in. It's bonkers. It's crazy. But let's just say. 20 years ago, before the internet, you had a dafty. Now, what do I class as a dafty? A dafty is someone who's arrogant, who doesn't consider other people's opinion, who is egotistical, or who's just not a nice person. Hmm. It's nothing to do with anything other than what could have been learned. Sure. So you've got a dafty. So years ago, a dafty, very right wing, very whatever it is, sends a letter to the local newspaper because that was their only platform. And the local newspaper would have a decent editor and would go, oh, there's a monthly dafty letter. And that would go in the bin. And it never go anywhere. Today, a dafty goes on the internet and batters in, let's meet dafty pals. Mm. And there's another thousand dafty pals all year, and find they've all got now. a voice. And all of a sudden, it's a movement. So where do you balance that up? Do you balance it up that it's a great thing because it gives people a voice? Or does it come back to the power thing about responsibility? And I think it's a balance. Uh, so you will have imagery today. And I don't work in photography as much today as, as I did. I still do personal projects. And I still love getting involved in it. But I am absolutely 100% there are still some beautiful, important imagery, more so probably today than ever been. Because by the law of average, there's far more people taking images today. Sure. So there's a fair chance that you're going to get, you know, better ones. But the probably less chance of being recognized or, or noticed yeah, because or remembered. yeah, there can be so much, you know. Um this is like a question I've kinda of, I suppose always wanted to ask you, but has there ever been like a project or a person that you've either always wanted to shoot but never got the opportunity to, or maybe it was planned and then at the last moment it fell through? There, there, there's been a few few situations that, but I, I never look upon it as the one anyway. that got away. <laughs> no, never because you know what that might have been the plane I was meant I was going to go and it was going to fall out the sky. Who yeah. knows? You know. No, no. So I try to look upon it as, and that sounds ever so grown up. Don't get me wrong. I can sit in traffic jams, get really pissed off, but I do try to think this traffic jam slowed me down for a reason. There was one chap. Well, not just one. There's many, but one. And we were in correspondence, and it was through an assistant. I, both my last two New York assistants were Brazilian, and they were brilliant. But one of them uh, came from, uh, well, he came from the South. He came from Port Alegre. Uh, but he lived had connections with Rio. And there was an architect I wanted to photograph called Oscar Neymeyer. And Oscar Neymeyer worked until the day he died, mm. when he was 105. And I'd get this really nice letter through Daniel, my assistant, uh, saying that Mr. Neymeyer was considering it and we could make it happen. But he died no long uh, after that. So that never shame. happened. But then, you know what? There's there's always people that you think 
you know, that I would like to fall in. Of course, I can't think of one at the moment, but there's there's tons of people, yeah. you know. So there's lots of projects and, and lots of ideas. And, 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 and also, for me now, it's diversity. It's moving into different, you know, avenues and working in different fields. Mm. Moving kind of slightly, I suppose, just in the general realm of creativity, do you think creativity is something that can be taught to someone? Or do you think it's like a... Because you uh, obviously didn't discover your creativity you can, until later can, in life. Well, I, th I think... I think... One thing that worries me today is we seem to lose an element of resilience. But the first thing we do... Is, resil uh, uh, is, is resilience. As a, as a baby, we try to get up, we've all fallen. It's the first thing we do. So we use different methods, and they're all creative. Somebody just screams their lungs out for their mother or their father to pick them up. Yeah. Another person is just so determined. They keep going up, falling down, keep going up, falling down. Keep... Another person thinks, hey, you know what? I'm going to hold on to that table leg. So I think we all have degrees of creativity, but I can sit and battle this table and make a noise. Is it necessarily a tune? Yes, but is it a tune that has a level of interest, understanding, credibility? I do think there's a thing as a visual language. I think you can look at something and it just touches something that possibly we can't put into words as yet. Mm. But it's like breathing. It's like breathing, we all breathe. But until you start to think about breathing, you know, it's funny. If you think I'm going to take the next 10 breaths and I'm going to be really aware of them, you find it difficult, but you do it every day. That's why meditation is so difficult. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and I think it's like creativity. So I think we do have all degrees of creativity, and it depends on reasons why you want to do it. But I also think it's important, and the one crux for me that's so important is inspiration. So can creativity be taught? I think it can be nurtured, and I can I think it can be suggested. Yeah. But I think it comes through inspiration. That if you show people and you understand and you try and find things that is something inherent to them, then I think, yes, I would like to think it could be taught. Different levels, but yeah, it could yeah. be taught. You know? Awesome. And final question, uh, which is a question I've asked a couple of other people on the show, but do you feel creatively satisfied or do you always have uh, a yearning no, to kind of no, continue? No, I think, if, but I don't mean that I'm unsatisfied. So, for instance, now, most people know my background's photography, but for years I was directing TV commercials and, and more and more recently I've been working as a... Creative consultant sounds a bit too arsy for me. <laughs> but do you know what I mean? A company will come to me and say, right, David, what do you think? And I'll go, well, this is that. And it's only my opinion. So I'm basically getting paid for my opinion. But it's just based on experience. So there's, I'm doing work for a whiskey company, Balblair Whiskey. I'm doing work for the John Byrne Awards. Uh, there's two other companies I can't say their names yet, but I've started working for them, but they've not said it, so I shouldn't say it. Uh, and that, and, and I, I'm, I've been doing quite a lot of judging stuff. I mean, there was, there was a, two things earlier this year. Uh, one through uh, Tapestry, the Corpus Prize. And a friend approached me and said, would you, a friend of a friend, would you be a judge on Tapestry? I said, I know nothing about Tapestry. And they said, no, but it doesn't matter. We want your aesthetic eye on it. We want your, your thought process on it. Uh, and, and I really enjoyed it. Uh, and that was an exhibition at the Invalid House. All right, yeah. And then a completely different uh, area, I was asked to be a judge for the National Museums of Scotland Silversmith Award, the, the Glen Morangy Prize. Wow. Uh, and then again, I said, I don't know anything about, <laughs> you know, silversmiths. But they have experts. But what they're looking for is more a bigger picture a different way of thinking on it. And I think that's what's important. You know, if you keep doing the same thing, you're going to be really lucky if you get a different result. Yeah. But if you just look at things sometimes a wee bit differently, it can open up a whole new world. And I think things like that are really interesting to me. So I will always work in projects, but the projects 
I, I want to develop more. And it's like the thing with my role, and I, I see it's a massive responsibility at the universities, at, at Napier as chancellor, that I, I believe there's two things in education for me. And I, I have quite strong views on education. It's perhaps not the time and place to talk about it. But because I have a responsibility to a bigger picture. Mm -hmm. But I think we have a moral responsibility to inspire those who trust us with some of the most precious years in their life. Because there's two things that have never changed in education, hope and inspiration. We're still teaching people the same way we done many years ago. And I think there's massive scope to change it. And one of the things I've started to try and do in my role as chancellor is bring together the world of art, commerce and education and trying to get them to work hand in hand. They've all got to respect each other and they've got to all understand each other's approach and opinion. But come on, surely you can find common ground. Yeah. And I think that comes back to being in the, the, the working on the back end of a minesweeper in the Navy or working in a prison. It's about problem solving. It's about resolving issues. It's about considering different perspectives. It's about having making decisions and making fast decisions. Uh, you know, it's it's bringing things together. And I find that interesting. And that, to me, is not that much different than I'm about to design an interior of a building. But that's the same as filling a frame, a camera frame. All it is is a matter of opinion. That goes in that corner, that goes up there, that goes there. Sure. So it doesn't matter if you're doing a camera frame or a stately home. You know, you're just, you're putting in your your thought process uh, and and that's one thing I laugh about in the way that today there's still there's still something that's never changed like when you go to a party because I don't know how to describe myself and you go and you meet someone and say what do you do and and this is generally the rule hey, I'm a photographer what kind of photography do you do well and I don't mean to sound arse well I, I don't really know do, do, do you work for the daily record no, but I've got a lot of friends who do. And and, and I know people do, but I don't work for the daily record, not as such. Uh, right, do you do weddings? No, nope. I've never photographed a wedding, but that's not one. So they get bored at this point. Or they think, oh, you're an arse, you know, because you can't <laughs> give a straight answer. So then they, they sort of get bored and they do a half turn away and they turn back and they go, have you ever photographed anybody famous? <laughs> and you go, yeah, quite a lot of people. I work with a lot of people. And, and, and they go, and it's always the two. In recent times, Spice Girls. I said, no, I've not photographed anybody for Spice Girls. Anybody for Love Island? No, nope, nobody for Love Island. And then they think, that's you, you're, you're not worth talking to. So they go Fucking away. Fucking Love Island, And then you think, Christ. Well, how the fuck do I describe what I do? And, and the best way I can describe what I do is I offer an opinion. That's what I do. You know, that's all I do. It's not right and it's not wrong. But it's, but it's, it's, it's my opinion. And, and I'm, that's it. Awesome. Well, David, it has been an absolute pleasure, as always, and I really appreciate you coming on the show. Um, where can people find you online, I suppose? Online? Uh, or anyway, you know, and, and David at this point, com? is that what you do? I did yeah. just .com, yep. yep. Mm -hmm. yep. And also on uh, Instagram as well, yep. I'm sure. Yeah. Yep. So to wrap up, as per usual, folks, please head over to the website, which is the mitmpodcast.com. That's the mitmpodcast.com, where you can find out more about the show, Find all the different episodes on all the different platforms. Once you head over to your play favorite platform, please hit the subscribe button and make sure you get notified when the new episode goes up. And while you're there, please leave a review. It, As per usual, it lets me know what you think, but it also helps bring other people into the show also. That's it from us here. Thank you very much for listening, guys, and I hope you found some method in the madness. <laughs>